Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. Welcome to today's meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California. I'm Dr. Karen Philbrick, Executive Director of the Mineta Transportation Institute at San Jose State University. We are a university transportation center focused on improving the mobility of people and goods. And it's my pleasure to chair today's program. Today, we are pleased to present the 12th annual Norman Y. Mineta National Transportation Finance Summit electrifying the transportation future. A special thank you to our founder, the Honorable Norman Y. Mineta, 14th U.S. Secretary of Transportation. He's joining us today from the East Coast. Before we get to the formal program and our distinguished speakers, I'm very pleased to introduce a special guest, the Honorable Pete Buttigieg, 19th U.S. Secretary of Transportation. Prior to joining the Biden-Harris administration, Secretary Buttigieg served two terms as mayor of his hometown in South Bend, Indiana. A graduate of Harvard University and a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford, Secretary Buttigieg served for seven years as an officer in the U.S. Navy Reserve, taking a leave of absence from the mayor's office for a deployment to Afghanistan in 2014. Time prevents a full accounting of his many accomplishments, so I will simply say welcome. We are so pleased you could join us for this fireside chat, Mr. Secretary. Karen, thank you so much for uh, the kind introduction and uh, thrilled to be reconnected with the, the Commonwealth Club, which I've, I've so enjoyed addressing and very honored to be in, in the virtual company of uh, Secretary Mineta, somebody whose uh, public service uh, is also something that time would prevent us uh, fully acknowledging uh, even now, but uh, who has opened doors for so many, who has been very kind to me in uh, uh, introducing me to this uh, position following in his footsteps and whose record of service in uniform and in public leadership uh, really is inspiring. So uh, uh, honored to be associated with that name and, and appreciate the chance to uh, speak with uh, uh, the experts and, and uh, attendees here who are so interested in some of the most important questions before us right now. Um, I'll speak for just a, a few very brief moments and then look forward to a, a, a brief exchange as well. But uh, the main thing I want to convey is the importance of vehicle electrification to meeting the president's goals for our climate. This administration views climate change as a defining challenge in our time. It's why at the April Climate Summit hosted at the White House, the president laid out the ambitious target to cut U.S. carbon emissions in half by 2030, in addition to re-establishing U.S. participation in the Paris Climate Accord. And the, the scale that we need in order to actually make that real is why the president's jobs plan is so important, especially when it comes to electric vehicles. Now, I believe the industry is moving there already. I believe adoption around the world is happening already. So some would ask why uh, push on this if this is where things are headed. And I think the, the reason has to do with answering three questions. First of all, if electric vehicles are the future, will they be made in America? Uh, will America be leading these markets? Will there be American workers and American firms on American soil making EVs? And I think that largely depends on our policy choices. Secondly, are they going to be affordable and accessible to all Americans, especially those who are less wealthy? and those who live in rural areas, which for reasons I'll go into in a minute, are among those who stand the most to gain, but not if they can't afford it in the first place. And third, maybe most importantly, okay, an EV transition may be ahead, but will it happen fast enough to beat climate change before it's too late? And so much on that depends on the choices we make. So let me unpack each of those very briefly. First of all, making the cars of the future in America. This is why the president's plan focuses on every part of that domestic supply chains, retooling factories to build components, funding manufacturers for training programs, uh, helping Americans get the skills to build batteries and other parts of electric vehicles, as well as assembling the vehicles themselves, uh, and creating all the jobs that come with that. And by the way, a lot of these jobs are not newfangled, futuristic, mysterious jobs. 
this is the auto workers who will make cars. It is the electrical workers who will install the charger base that we need to support those cars. Uh, this is, in other words, a very blue collar vision for a greener America. And the plan incentivizes companies to manufacture their cars right here at home. Which brings me to the second point, which is making these electric vehicles more affordable and accessible. Uh, as mentioned uh, earlier, the, the jobs plan envisions rebates and tax incentives for buyers of electric cars. And this is to make the upfront cost more attainable for more Americans, as well as the $15 billion we envision to build a network of half a million chargers across the country. Because there are some places where, even as we speak, you could easily make a profit on an electric vehicle charger. Others where it doesn't pencil out on its own, uh, unless we make some policy choices. And often those are uh, rural communities. Uh, rural areas have been the last to be fully connected to any of the new advances in our country, electricity, telephones, broadband, internet. And in each of those cases, good things happen when policy stepped in. Uh, that's something we need to do here. Rural residents actually drive, because they drive 66% more miles, just as a matter of common sense, uh, burn more fuel and could save more money. I'm thinking about my in-laws in Michigan, a mom and pop landscaping uh, company, and, and what my father and mother-in-law could save with an electric pickup truck. Uh, they could charge at home. They will have an electric truck that actually has better torque than the old uh, gas truck, which is useful when my father-in-law is plowing snow in the winter as well as when they're towing equipment. Um, and uh, they won't have to worry about the distance if we get the charging network right. Uh, so every family that's, that's thinking about uh, their family budget stands to gain uh, from this EV revolution, but only if we set the table in the right way. Uh, and time is of the essence. Uh, the climate crisis, the, 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 the timelines, they're not established by Congress. They're not established by officials like me. They're established by physics, and they're bearing down on us. We can rise to meet this challenge and do it in time and be proud of our actions beginning in the early 2020s when it came to decarbonizing transportation, but only if we act now, only if we act big, which is why you see such energy and such boldness in the president's vision. So I appreciate the chance to, just to share that quick outline with you and uh, I look forward to our conversation. Well, thank you so much for those comments. They're very intriguing. And, and let's just jump right into the first question here. At a conceptual level, what's the appropriate role for the federal government in helping the U.S. transition towards electrification of the fleet? And what specific components of the American Jobs Plan will support that transition? So I think the federal role really is to fill in the gaps. State government, local government, private sector, they're all playing a role. Uh, but it's clear that they shouldn't be asked to do it alone. The jobs plan includes $174 billion total to win the EV market. And uh, the main elements of that include 15, as I mentioned earlier, to develop this national charging network. This would be a formula program to strategically deploy the EV charging infrastructure, uh, that, that as, well, as well as uh, uh, potentially other alternative fuel sources along designated fuel, fuel corridors that we're already identifying in partnership with the Department of Energy so that it's very clear where that national network is and so that range anxiety doesn't stop adoption. And then, as I mentioned earlier, those consumer rebates and tax incentives. Uh, now, we also have to recognize it's not just private vehicles, right? We are a huge, as the federal government, we're a huge uh, uh, pro, uh, purchaser of vehicles. So electrifying the federal fleet, the postal service, uh, school buses. Uh, the, the jobs plan has the funds to electrify at least 20% uh, of the yellow bus fleet. 40% uh, of transit vehicles, which is obviously a, a big part of the solution. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even as we work toward getting the jobs plan passed, we're working this into what we're doing right now. So for the first time, have uh, defined in new ways climate as a criterion in our existing grant program, both to send a message and to make real improvements and help communities that are doing it. So the federal government's not going to own and operate every charger. We're certainly not going to design, develop, and sell electric vehicles. But we do have a very important role. And the jobs plan is part of how we step up to that role. Absolutely. Thank you. And in that response, you touched on equity. So I'm curious, how can the federal government ensure the benefits from electrification, whether cleaner air or well-paying new jobs, are dispersed equitably to communities across our entire nation, whether rural or urban? So the truth is that uh, our transportation policy uh, has a mixed legacy in this country from an equity perspective. But now's the chance to do something about it. 
It's why the jobs plan includes a Justice 40 initiative. We call it Justice 40 because it envisions 40 percent of the overall benefits of the federal investments around things like climate going to disadvantaged communities that have been overburdened or underserved because of federal policy. Uh, it's a chance to make right what was broken in the past. You also consider the fact that often it is uh, uh, communities of color and low income communities that are more likely to live near uh, ports or highways where there is more particulate matter coming from tailpipe emissions and therefore higher rates of susceptibility to things like asthma. There's a public, there's a health equity issue baked into our climate equity issue, all of which is a transportation equity issue. So this needs to be envisioned in, in all of our work, specifically funded in the president's jobs plan vision, but also just contemplated in the ways that we're working with states, with cities, uh, with communities, notably with tribes. Uh, and as your question mentioned, uh, this is about racial equity, but also regional equity and making sure we support urban and rural communities alike. Uh, rural communities may struggle with EV adoption uh, in terms of range, but they're actually better off in terms of charging access because most houses stand alone. You can plug it in your garage. Urban environments, it's the opposite. You're not as worried about range, but not everybody has a house with its own uh, plug points. And, and that's why we need to think about how to make shared or uh, publicly accessible uh, charging stations more available in cities. All of this adds up into a picture where every American is better off because we're doing this and because we're doing it now. Absolutely. And, you know, you touched on the importance of having well-paying jobs, family supporting jobs. And to what extent will moving the nation, will, will we face moving towards an electric vehicle, excuse me, to what extent will moving the nation towards electric vehicles create those quality jobs, those well-paying jobs that can support our families? Yeah, I think this is where we get to prove the falsehood of the old framework of climate versus jobs. This is about job creation through climate action. And that's why whenever you hear the president talk about climate, he's also talking about jobs. Uh, this is a great example of how to do it. Uh, and uh, it's why the jobs plan calls for investments uh, connected to things like local hire, community workforce, project labor agreements, registered apprenticeships, uh, because we also need to get people into these jobs who haven't had a shot at it in the past. Uh, and uh, I applaud those uh, organized uh, uh, labor unions, for example, that have been proactive about welcoming in uh, those who have not had the, the historical uh, uh, expectation of seeing people who look like them on work sites. We've got to get this right. Um, and, uh, uh, and that's part of what we can do in this electric vehicle revolution. So true. And you remind me that if you can't see it, you can't be it. And how critically important it is that we engage that K through 12 sector also in this conversation about yep. futures and transportation. I know we're down to our last couple minutes together, so I have one final question. What are the key barriers the nation will face in moving towards this electric vehicle fleet? So a lot of it's technical, uh, supply <laughs> chains, electrical grid infrastructure. Uh, a lot of it's financial, uh, making sure we're actually willing to make the investments, those market-making investments that catapult uh, the uh, electric vehicle adoption faster than it's been. But actually, I think a lot of it's cultural. Uh, we just need to realize that part of our tradition has always been innovation. And so in an odd way, nothing could be truer to our tradition, the same tradition that produced internal combustion engine vehicles that defined my city until the, the collapse of the Studebaker car company in the 60s. And then that collapse defined my city and our recovery from it defines the life of my hometown town to this day. We need to realize the relationship between past, present and future and acknowledge that nothing could be more American than finding a way to lead the world on the cars of the future, just as we did on the cars of the past. Absolutely. What a pleasure it has been to be with you today. Thank you for making the time. Thank you for sharing your incredible comments. And we wish you well, Mr. Secretary. Well, thank you. Thanks for this conversation. And, and thanks again for the expertise and the passion of everybody participating in this event. These, these kinds of problem solvers are going to create incredible results. And I think we'll look back and be proud of the 2020s if we get off to the right beginning right now. For decades, as we all know, motor fuel taxes have generated the majority of state and federal funds spent on transportation, even if recently these taxes have been losing their purchasing power. However, a shift toward electric vehicles will require a new transportation funding model. Today's speakers will discuss the challenges and the opportunities with such options as mileage fees, carbon taxes, higher vehicle registration fees, or a shift entirely away from user-generated revenue.
I can't wait to hear what our speakers have to say. The program consists of two parts. The Honorable Tokes Omi Shakin, Director of the California Department of Transportation and an MTI Board of Trustees member will give today's keynote talk and take questions in the first portion. Then a distinguished panel will discuss the opportunities for every level of government to help recover transportation revenues in our uncertain future. To set the stage for today's program, I'm now pleased to introduce U.S. Senator Alex Padilla, who will make some introductory remarks. Now, Senator Padilla is the proud son of immigrants from Mexico who previously served on the Los Angeles City Council and was then elected to the California State Senate, where he passed more than 70 bills, including landmark legisla legislation to combat climate change. He was named one of Sacramento's most effective legislators before being sworn in as California's first Latino Secretary of State in 2015. He was reelected in 2018, receiving the most votes of any Latino elected official in the United States. Now he's gone on to even greater things. In December 2020, Senator Padilla was appointed by Governor Gavin Newsom to finish the term of Vice President Kamala Harris. Welcome, Senator Padilla. Hi, I'm Senator Alex Padilla. Thank you for inviting me to open this important conversation on the challenges and opportunities of electrifying our transportation system. As we begin the process of recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic, we must invest in a more just and more sustainable future. In California, we know that climate action can't wait. California is already experiencing the devastating effects of the climate crisis, from record-breaking droughts and wildfires to coastal erosion and habitat loss. And the transportation sector is the largest generator of greenhouse gas emissions in the United States. To meet the demands of the climate crisis, we need to make bold investments in cleaner transportation technologies. Along with partners in the Senate, I introduced a resolution that outlines a plan for electrifying America's future. We call for a widespread modernization of the power grid to support the electrification of high emission sectors like transportation. And I'm proud to support President Biden's call for $174 billion of federal funding to bolster the electric vehicle market. Transitioning to electric vehicles is an essential step in reducing our carbon footprint. It will also strengthen our economy by spurring the creation of good paying jobs and innovative technologies. But federal grant funding is just one of the funding sources we'll need to renew our infrastructure for a clean transportation future. Low interest federal loan programs and bonds are also helping transportation agencies to access the capital they need to get shovels in the ground. In more than 20 years of public service, I've seen that virtually every major infrastructure project using federal funds also leverages state and or local dollars. And increasingly, public-private partnerships are bringing additional investments to infrastructure plans that will pay off for the whole community. It's our job as policymakers to ensure that our funding strategies and new projects are also rooted in equity. Low income communities, communities of color, immigrant communities and Native Americans disproportionately live on the front lines of the climate crisis, but have too often been left out of critical infrastructure investments. To address decades of environmental injustice and disparities in health and employment, we must bring robust funding to projects in vulnerable and disadvantaged communities. We must ensure that electric vehicle infrastructure, like charging and fueling stations, are available to all Americans in all communities. We should bring cleaner, safer electric school buses to every school, an effort I'm leading in the Senate. And we need to improve the sustainability and reliability of public transportation which has enormous potential to connect communities to jobs and resources. That's why I'm a proud co-sponsor of the Build Green Infrastructure and Jobs Act, which would invest $500 billion over the next 10 years to accelerate our transition to an all-electric public transportation future. 
This bill would create up to 1 million jobs at the same time as supporting equity in fighting the root causes of climate change. Now is the time to build a clean transportation future. That means innovating beyond our traditional infrastructure funding tools because the investments we make today will multiply in value for our communities and our environment. I look forward to hearing from today's speakers and working together to promote a bold, equitable renewal of our transportation infrastructure. Thank you. And now it's my pleasure to introduce today's moderator, Therese McMillan, Executive Director of the Metropolitan Transportation Commission and a member of the MTI Board of Trustees. MTC is a transportation planning, financing, and coordinating agency for the nine county San Francisco Bay Area. Ms. McMillan also serves as the top executive for the Association of Bay Area Governments. Now, previously, she worked for MTC for 25 years, including eight years as MTC's Deputy Executive Director for Policy. But this was before her 2009 appointment by then President Barack Obama to serve as Deputy Administrator of the Federal Transit Administration. McMillan subsequently served as Acting FTA Administrator before taking a position at LA Metro as their Chief Planning Officer. We're so pleased to have her back in the Bay Area, and she will be introducing our keynote speaker and leading our panel in a vibrant discussion. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, Therese, and please take it away. Oh, thank you, uh, Dr. Philbrick. I need to say Karen as a dear friend and colleague. And it is now my pleasure to introduce today's keynote speaker, Tokes Omishakin, Director of the California Department of Transportation. Mr. Omishakin was appointed the 33rd Director of Caltrans in 2019 by Governor Gavin Newsom. And as director, he manages a $15 billion budget and nearly 21,000 employees who oversee 50,000 miles of highways, maintain 13,000 bridges, provide permitting of more than 400 public use airports, fund three of Amtrak's busiest inner city rail services, and provide transit support to more than 200 local and regional transit agencies. So that's a lot of big numbers. <laughs> Mr. Omishakin's transportation vision for California features a safe, sustainable, and multimodal transportation network that builds on strong local partnerships. Welcome, Mr. Omishakin, Tokes. And uh, please take it away in terms of your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Therese. Uh, very good to see you, my, my very dear friend. In California specifically, our goal is to achieve a large scale equitable EV network that significantly contributes to the environmental, social and economic future of the state. Caltrans, our department is emphatically embracing the electrification of California. We aspire to lead by example and focus on our end users. We know the many rewards to be reaped from such a shift to EVs are unprecedented, and these rewards can be, can be beneficial to all. Cleaner air for, for all to breathe, decreased carbon emissions on our planet, the potential to better manage road congestion, and the potential to improve safety, just to name a few. In addition to these benefits, many are starting to recognize the advantages related to cost as well gas savings, state and federal rebates, improved access on tow roads and HOV lane access, carpooling benefits and credits on federal taxes. But of course, nothing worthwhile is ever achieved without growing pains. Uh, Secretary Buttigieg mentioned this earlier, the challenges do exist. Challenges are implicit in achieving any type of success. Some of the more immediate challenges Caltrans faces in transitioning its fleet and assisting partners in the state as well. Number one, uh, medium duty, heavy duty uh, ZEV technology is still emerging. The charging that's often needed uh, to assist these types of vehicles in, in the state uh, is still up and coming. It's still emerging. Funding, uh, the fact that MDs, HDs, uh, ZEVs are still relatively expensive. 
uh, for small transit operators in the state, ZEV buses, uh, zero emission vehicle buses, do not pass particular specs to receive federal reimburse- reimbursement and can only rely on state funding and reimbursement. And also related to funding is the fact that uh, Secretary Buttigieg mentioned this earlier as well, the fact that so much of the revenue in most of our states depends on the current system we have uh, using fuel. And the fact that as we make the tra- transition, it continues to de- deplete uh, the funding uh, for our DOTs. Time is a challenge. Uh, the, the transition of the department's fleet uh, will, will take on. Uh, the department cannot replace its fleet overnight. Replacements require uh, a contingency upon mileage and age thresholds. So we can't just go in and change out vehicles uh, without really addressing or, or thinking about the fact that uh, certain vehicles haven't met the, the required mileage or age threshold. Uh, the charging uh, ba- and battery life. There's a lack of uh, Caltrans uh, facilities or state facilities and public charging for heavy duty trucks. And a third of that 11,000 vehicle fleet that I mentioned are heavy duty uh, machinery, heavy duty trucks. The charging times uh, for electric vehicles can s- sometimes still be slow if we don't have a fast charger. The critical response times uh, may be impacted if electric vehicle batteries are depleted. Also, grid concerns. Uh, The fact that we need a resilient and reliable electric grid to ensure the smooth functioning of electric, uh, of our electric vehicle fleet in the event of a power outage or or extreme weather events or natural disasters. We need a reliable uh, grid in case those things happen. Uh, And finally, as far as challenges goes, uh, resting on our laurels uh, due to this new innovation, expecting that it will solve many of the complex transportation and livability challenges uh, we face uh, in, in our cities uh, and in our respective states. Um, also, uh, one more thing to add, I think Secretary Buttigieg uh, touched on this as well, is the human side of this transition uh, as, we, as we try to get into uh, more adaptation. Though it may not be as engaging uh, to discuss policy and blueprints for the EV transition, adaptation and behavior change is in fact one of the highest priorities and most necessary elements to an effective, smooth transition to EVs. While fleets, uh, infrastructure, and funding are integral uh, to the implementation of electric vehicle uh, progression and usually receive all the spotlight, the philosophical component is essential. A solid understanding and getting to yes by our government agencies, the industry, and most importantly, the end users, the public we serve is very important. Within this massive transition to electrification and eventually obtaining many layered gains from a shift, the challenges are not going to be just logistical. Getting people and freight into zero emission transportation will continue to require a series of decisions related to rational economics and or emotional behavior. Mindset and behavior change go hand in hand with this transition. The public's confidence in industry and public sector are critical to adaptation. Our outlook and expectations must be markedly different than they were just even a decade ago. We in government have a responsibility to promote the benefits of EVs, model the process, and encourage consumers as we embrace this new direction. Creating an environment that helps consumers and fleet operators better understand their options and overcome real and perceived barriers is critical to maintaining the rapidly growing ZEV network. Holding summits such as this one, uh, kudos to Dr. Philbrick and MTI, disseminating information, conducting outreach and providing incentives are also good stepping stones to bring the general public on board. Taking the lead is key. And I'm thrilled to see the inertia nationwide moving in a direction that will ultimately provide a cleaner, healthier, and more equitable environment for all. Speaking of equity, Senator Padilla touched on this. More than ever, as we, as everything we do in transportation, California's EV efforts are being built on a foundation of equity. An aperture of equity is at the core of every respective operation. At Caltrans, We've organized our equity focus into four specific areas. We call these four areas the four P's framework. People, 
projects or programs, partnerships, and planning. And I'll touch on a, a few of these uh, b- before I conclude in, in a few minutes. Going electric encompasses not only the four P areas, but it also follows the directive of our strategic plan, uh, which from that strategic plan, the mission statement says provide a safe and reliable transportation network that serves all people and respects the environment. In addition to targeted investments that support the Caltrans fleet, Caltrans aims to support the public transition to ZEVs, especially in underserved communities. Research conducted by the International Council on Clean Transportation states, rapid, the rapid reduction in the cost of used EVs over the next decade will enable lower income households to access EVs as well. As a result, there are many important policy implications. The great potential for increasing EVs affordability across the used market, co- cost reduction in new EVs will lead to decreased used EV prices, Higher rates of depreciation for the first time owners will also benefit lower income second owners. Cost savings from EVs can enable equity benefits in many cases by 2030. For car owners in the lowest 20% income segment, switching to an EV will save households approximately $1,000 annually by 2030. Purchase incentives aimed at the lower income groups will also be most effective. California will strive to first help the communities impacted adversely by amounts, by the high amounts of air pollution. The ZEVs will follow the infrastructure, identifying those disadvantaged areas in California with the worst air quality will help us plan and install medium duty, heavy duty infrastructure at those locations where where pollution has hit the hardest. Operating clean ZEV trucks helps everybody, the operators, workers exposed to potential emissions and the communities where those vehicles operate. And talking about planet, the trajectory that has brought us to this point cannot be dismissed or minimized. Approximately 40% of the GHG in California's environment comes from tailpipes. So we can't overstate the significance of the need to make our carbon footprint smaller and smaller. Our sustainable transition to EVs will be one of the key components in reducing the emissions of greenhouse gases on a very large scale. We're experiencing a historic pivot in our shift to reduction of non-renewable energy and working hard to simultaneously prevent further negative impacts to our climate. Nearly 10% of all light duty, medium duty vehicles sold in California today are now ZEBS. The Biden administration's decision to recommit our nation to the Paris Agreement is also boosting momentum of our EV transition. California is prioritizing funding sustainable transportation projects as a part of a new climate action strategy known as CAPTI, the Climate Action Plan for Transportation Infrastructure. CAPTI outlines key investment strategies for investing billions of discretionary transportation dollars annually to aggressively combat and adapt to climate change while supporting public health safety and equity goals. Also notable in California is our long range transportation plan, CTP 2050, that was released earlier this year and very much the components of the future plan of this plan addresses the future need for electrified uh, transportation system in California. Both plans also address executive order 7920, the most aggressive clean air policy in the United States it directs the state to require, uh, requires the state rather, that by 2035, all new cars and passenger trucks sold in California will be zero emission vehicles. Citing the urgency of climate change, our governor, Gover- Governor Gavin Newsom, issued this executive order to dramatically reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Um, in that executive order, he said, we need to more quickly move toward our low carbon, sustainable and resilient future now. And for the signaling, this substantial change is on the horizon. Over the last few years, many car manufacturers, as we've seen this year already, have already stepped up in the movement, progressing from gas pump to power plugs. Final piece here, what are we doing? Caltrans has been a leader among state agencies and adopting ZEVs and building charging infrastructure. To date, 
we've installed 33 public direct current fast chargers at 19 Caltrans owned facilities to fill in light duty charging infrastructure gaps along the right of way in rest areas, park and ride lots, district offices, and maintenance stations. Most recently, Caltrans added five public fast charging vehicle stations along highways in Inyo and Kern counties. With an awareness that a one size fits all approach to tra transition, the state's fleet won't be effective. Caltrans is also exploring a variety of zero emission technologies that make the most sense for an array of medium duty and heavy duty vehicle types. The federal funding uh, that's on the way, President Biden's America Jobs Plan aims for the United States DOT to spend nearly $100 billion on incentives to consumers to purchase EVs. In addition to providing grants and incentives, the AJP addresses the need to support EV de deployment with tax credits, as I alluded to earlier. Electric uh, transit buses and school buses uh, will also uh, be a part of this growth. And the federal fleet as well will experience a, a, a turnover to, to being more electric. Also pleased, the AJP will direct $35 billion of its funding towards research and innovation in, in transformative development for energy climate related topics. An additional $40 billion is being proposed in upgrading research infrastructure, such as labs and networks. This can only bode well for our climate goals and help us power forward in these developments. Caltrans strongly values our partnership in the work we do and our partnership and collaboration with other state agencies and the federal government is essential for an effective EV transition to, to transpire. The effort is bigger than any one department or agency. We're closely working with the California Air Resources Board, the California Energy Commission, among other indispensable partners. The department will continue working with state partners to more specifically define Caltrans's appropriate role in providing medium duty, heavy duty, a ZEV charge infrastructure to support the state's overall ZEV transition. As we maneuver into the next level of EVs and related infrastructure, our alliances with our partners and input from stakeholders are without our greatest asset. Collaboration with our partners as we shift to an EV forefront will only benefit our public in this necessary work towards safer roads, better managing congestion and environmental benefits. One of those key partners is definitely the Manetta Transportation Institute. MTI does outstanding work on behalf of our industry. Again, I appreciate you having me here today and a great thank you as well to the Commonwealth Club for organizing today's outstanding event. I look forward to the discussion and questions. Thank you. And I have the pleasure of moderating a few questions with um, our guest uh, before we go to the next part of the program. So, Tokes, one of the things I, I want to pick up on something that you ended with and reflecting on Secretary Buttigieg's um, uh, observation that when policy steps in, good things can happen. And I interpreted that to mean when we move with intention to change things, we're going to really see government working toward the common good, you know, which is a high and necessary aspiration. But as a fellow public servant, you and I both know <laughs> there's some inherent challenges with that. And you were speaking at the end about the necessary collaborations that are going to happen between multiple departments, you know, the Air Resources Board, your department, Caltrans, Department of Energy, Department of Labor, Department of Finance, you know, the intersection of these efforts. And, you know, have to say coordination and speed maybe has not been, you know, uh, a fact of characterizing our efforts to move. But in this space, given that climate change is so critical in, in, and we need a response, does government itself needs to need to innovate differently alongside it to make the things happen that need to happen? Wow. Uh, D D Director McMillan, a, a very big question. Um, and and I, I think the answer to, to your question is, is definitely yes. It's yes. You know, when you think about the 
successes that we've had when it comes to innovation. Uh, you, you can go back 30, 40 years and you think about things like, for example, uh, the airbag coming into place or seat belts coming into place. Uh, clearly, there, there were leads in our government, uh, like, for example, NHTSA, uh, in helping to tr us to transition so that every vehicle eventually had a seat belt and every vehicle had an, uh, something as simple as an airbag. But we knew uh, time was of the essence um, in making those transitions. And we set hard and fast dates. Uh, even when you think about the cafe standards uh, that are a part of our uh, vehicle fleet today, hard and fast dates that we said, look, in 10 years, in five years, vehicles need to average X amount of uh, 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 gas mileage uh, uh, per gallon. S similar thing here. We need to understand who the lead is in this space. Uh, industry, no doubt, plays their role. But who's the lead? Let's be clear about that. And if we keep our eye on the prize, and the prize in this particular case is people. I mean, that's why we have the responsibilities we have, not for us to, um, uh, you know, be chief, chiefs of our kingdoms and say, look, you got to, um, you know, you got to follow all these, you know, all these steps and, uh, and the red tape that we like to roll out. You mentioned the, the, the great speed of lightning that we like to move in and govern it. <laughs> Get out of the way with that stuff. And and say, we we got it. We got to deploy this because we know what the benefits are for people. Set hard and fast dates, um, and and push towards it. I, I know it's it's easier said than done. I mean, you've you've been at this uh, uh, longer than me, so you know these these traps more than I do. Uh, but I think the more leadership we show and step up and say, look, it's about the people. Let's go on this. I think we can get there. You know, let's 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 pick up on that theme about setting hard and fast goals and timelines and whatnot, because I think that's really essential. But there's an area that Senator Padilla talked about, um, Secretary Buttigieg, and I know it is a passion of yours as, as well as mine, which is the space on equity. And you know, we, we I think we all have heard throughout this presentation before that we seek that the benefits from electrification, whether it's cleaner air or well-paying jobs, are dispersed equitably to all communities, particularly those left behind. But it, I guess my question, though, is how what are the things that we need to really know in order to track that we're actually reaching the folks that need to benefit from this? Are, are there metrics that we need to put in place early? You know, what is the thinking? It's one thing to have intention. It's another thing to have results. So how would, in this equity space in particular, what are your thoughts there? Wow, that's not a very good question. Uh, there, there's a lot there. So, so several things. Uh, number one, I would say, first of all, who, who's getting access? Who's getting access to electric vehicles? So the California market, I'm not sure if a lot of people notice that that may be watching across the country, but the California Zev market is essentially 50% of the entire market in the country, 50% of um, a zero emission vehicles sold in the country are sold in California and stay in, and, and stay in California. So that's good news. But when you break down and start to look a little bit more closely at who is getting the benefits of the incentives and the rebates that we've put in place, over the years, you can clearly see that it's higher income communities making $150,000 and above. How much money have we put into this, into this program over the last decade? Between 2010 and 2020, a billion dollars, roughly, in incentives in California alone. So roughly $100 million a year. But a majority of that money, a majority of it, is going to uh, higher income families not uh, families who have the biggest need for incentives in the first place. <laughs> if you want to put incentives in place, they're not for the people who are well to do. Uh, they, they should be really pushing and helping uh, the less affluent. So that's number one. Uh, who's buying? How are incentives and rebates and tax breaks? How are they helping the people who are in the most need uh, for this? 
Also, um, uh, something that you can uh, sort of put a metric on and account for, where are we putting the infrastructure to support ZEV growth? Where is that happening? Um, is it happening in our the wealthiest of communities or is it, uh, is it you know, going to where <laughs> the communities where air quality challenges, for example, are the hardest? Uh, in our state, we can easily pinpoint on a map in the Bay Area, Teresa, where you lead us, you can easily pinpoint on a map where those lower income uh, or underserved communities are. Are we putting infrastructure there to support uh, the need uh, and assist with um, the anxiety uh, that often comes with owning one of these vehicles now uh, with, with, with the range that they have? So there are some metrics that I think um, that you can easily point to um, like that, that we have data on and say, OK, where is this happening? If we truly believe in, in a more equitable approach in this in this space, uh, those are some of the things that we can a uh, few things we can point to. Yeah. And, and uh, I think, as, as you point out, they're not necessarily hard. It's just being creative about how we use them. And mm -hmm. that's that's what we all need to, to do. One of the things that you, know, you observed and it was clearly a message running through um, uh, both the senator and the secretary's observations is this need for partnerships. And you spoke uh, very clearly about the opportunities for states, other state DOTs to be working with the federal government, et cetera. But of course, going down the next level, we need to work effectively with local government in this process. And as you might have been I, you know, I should know off the top of my head how many cities are in the entire state of California, but I know in my region, I all, I all have like 101 local jurisdictions to deal with. So we're talking a lot of people. But again, with, with the um, layers of, of technological change and financial you know, incentive and coordination um, that, that you mentioned in your remarks, how do you see an effective partnership with local government happening, particularly the difference between, say, um, the city of Los Angeles, which, you know, a, a capacity that's, you know, extraordinary versus, you know, a small town in the Central Valley? Do you have some thoughts, thoughts on that? Wow. Wow. Um, so uh, not, not a very good question by you, Therese. So, you know, in California, uh, one of the things that we focused on uh, that I've focused on since I've uh, been leading the department is trying to make sure that uh, our efforts to improve transportation clearly understand that uh, the needs may be different sometimes uh, in urban and rural, uh, but the service we need to provide, the relationship, the partnership that we need to have in urban versus rural, one can't be less than the other. Um, you know, sometimes because of a Bay Area or because of an L.A. where those two regions alone are 50 percent of the state's population, um, you know, sometimes the, you know, the smaller uh, uh, Imperial, uh, uh, the Central Valley or San Bernardino, the, the, the Inland Empire, uh, those places sort of get left. Uh, they get left behind in some of the discussions. But to me, it shouldn't matter. Um, partnership is partnership. Um, but the example you raise of LA, I was recently on a discussion with somebody from uh, Mayor Garcia, uh, Mayor Garcetti's uh, staff on this very issue and was impressed with the things that they were doing in LA. But what's, you know, what's pretty clear is that Mayor Garcetti and the city of LA have the capacity. I mean, they've got the resources to push. You know, we play a role there. We can assist in some of that growth. Um, and you talked about, you know, some of the needs in in uh, in less affluent parts of the state. So even though uh, uh, Mayor Garcetti and the city have the resources, there are places within the city that, you know, sometimes can get overlooked and we can come in and and support that. I'm not going to name some of those communities, but some some underserved communities we can help there. Uh, but the the more uh, rural or suburban parts um, of the state, we definitely can step up there as well. I mentioned Kern County and Inyo County in my remarks about the fact that we just installed fast chargers there. 
they have those needs just as well. And because of the layout and the development pattern and land use pattern there where things are a little bit more distant um, and the travel by car sometimes is a little bit further, I would even say uh, we should, you know, focus even more uh, with uh, local government um, in those particular areas. Uh, So it's, it's a little bit of a, it's a little bit of a a challenge sometimes when you're trying to balance where to go with, with, with resources, but the effort in relationship building and partnership should not matter. um, You know, because one urban area has, you know, it's, you know, this huge place and a Inyo County or Kern County doesn't have the same population centers. Um, So I I know that's a long way to answer that question, but uh, partnership definitely with local government, I think is going to be key for us in any role we play from the state DOT. And you know what, what I take away from your observations, Tokes, and I think it's, it's maybe a takeaway for all of us that we need, if we're going to tackle effectively climate change and this existential, um, you know, challenge to our planet, we have to have an unselfish sharing of knowledge Mm -hmm. that we all have to be working together to to jointly own the problem and the solution. So your your thoughts are are so well, um, so well placed. Well, we're near the end, unfortunately, of our of our time together. So why don't we end? Is there one thing that you would Say, what is the one thing that gives you the most hope that we're going to get ahead of this problem and 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 take advantage of this electrified future that uh, we're discussing today? Clearly, we as a nation, uh, Therese, we're coming around to the point where we understand the the arguments that we've had before, especially on the climate front on the sustainability environment from is moving away from us thinking about, well, what's causing it? I mean, for so many years now, that's where we focused about, well, is it human made or is the earth just doing what the earth does and temperatures are rising and fires just start on their own. (laughs) We're moving away finally from that to, I think we're in a place today where we're saying, look, it's happening. It's happening. Things are happening around us. We're seeing extreme weather events around us. Uh, Sea levels are rising. Fires are burning. Who cares about where, how it started? It's obvious with our own eyes, we can see what's taking place. And as we build and create the transportation system and the land use systems around us, we know they have a direct impact on that. In California, 40%. Some estimates up to 50% of transportation is impacting uh, GHG. So we're beyond, in my opinion, the days of saying, well, what's causing it to saying, look, it's happening. Let's do something. Um, That's given me a lot of hope um, that we're stepping forward with. And you can see by OEMs announcing, you know, new trucks, and all kinds of different new fleets into the system. So action is taking place. Um, uh, I can't think of a more exciting period for us to be working in a space where resources and policy are aligning with a direction that I think is going to continue to help with the transformation of this country. Pretty exciting time. It is. It is. And, you know, it's exciting for me and gives me hope that you'll be among the top leaders having us move forward. So thank you so much, Director Omashakin. Um, your, your work has been inspiring so far and, and I think we all will benefit from your, again, insights going forward. So thank you again. Thank you, Director McMillan. Thank you, I appreciate it. So what I'd like to do first is introduce our panel. Um, we have Dr. Asha Weinstein Agrawal, who is the director of the Mineta Transportation Institute's National Transportation Finance Center, as well as MTI Education Director and Professor of Urban and Regional Planning at San Jose State University. Her research agenda is guided by a commitment to the principles of sustainability and equity, namely that policy and planning tools 
um, that uh, communities adopt can, in fact, encourage environmentally friendly travel and improve accessibility for people struggling with poverty and other disadvantages. Dr. Agua has researched transportation revenue policy for over 20 years. We'll be tapping into that in expertise and our questions, focusing on holistic evaluation of different tax and fee options. Carlos Braceras is executive director of the Utah Department of Transportation. A registered professional engineer, doc, <clears throat> excuse me, Mr. Braceras was appointed to his current position by Utah Governor Gary Herbert in 2013 and reappointed to serve as executive director by Governor Spencer Cox in January of this year. Mr. Braceras is responsible for the Utah Department of Transportation's more than 1,600 employees and the design, construction, and maintenance of Utah's 6,000 mile system of roads and highways. He recently redefined the department's goals and mission, including implementing a road user charge program on the bleeding edge of change there in the country. He has also overseen the completion of massive highway projects. Carl Gardino is executive vice president of government affairs and policy at Bloom Energy and a longtime colleague and friend. He previously served as the long time president and CEO of the Silicon Valley Leadership Group, a prominent public policy trade association that represents more than 350 of Silicon Valley's most respected companies. He has championed public policy at the local, state and federal level for more than three decades. Mr. Gardino has also been appointed by Governors Schwarzenegger, Brown, and Newsom, respectively, to serve four consecutive terms on the California Transportation Commission. And last but not least is Dr. Daniel Sperling, a distinguished professor of civil engineering and environmental science and policy, and the founding director of the Institute of Transportation Studies at the University of California, Davis, my undergraduate alma mater. He holds the transportation seat on the California Air Resources Board and previously served as chair of the Transportation Research Board of the National Academies. He served twice as lead author for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, sharing the 2007, 2007 Nobel Peace Prize, um, and has testified to the U.S. Congress and authored or co-authored over 250 technical papers and 13 books, which I'm going to have to catch up with my summer reading uh, in, in the next few weeks. So now we're going to hear from all the panelists. And um, what I'd like to do, if it's fine with you, is just have us converse on a first name basis and uh, let us jump right in. So let me start, Dan, with you. Just how quickly is the fleet likely to turn electric, both in California and nationally? Um, this turnover was, was picked up by a number of our, our previous uh, speakers. So what are the key factors for both cars and trucks? And when are we likely to see enough non-petroleum vehicles that there'll be a noticeable hit to fuel tax revenues? Well, those are excellent questions, Therese. <laughs> um, we're all interested in knowing the answers. I think, you know, as you heard, everyone is so enthusiastic about electric vehicles, and I am as well. But actually, when we look at it, really ground this discussion, we say, okay, today, reality, the U.S., about 2% of sales are electric vehicles, and that means less than 1% of the fleet is electric. Even in California, we have, yes, 10% of sales, but it's really, it's 10%, and, but the fleet is about 2%. So 2% of the vehicles on the road are electric. So that's today. And the question is, how is this going to change? And as we heard from uh, a few speakers from uh, Caltrans Director Omish Omishakin about the executive order in California, 
we in California have a plan. Okay, so there's new regulations that are just being floated by the California Air Resources Board, which I'm a board member of. And that proposal, in, and it's probably going to be adopted something like this, is requiring that 25% of the sales be, be zero emission. I should say zero emission because it can be electric or hydrogen. 20, 25% in 2026 going up to 100% of sales in 2035. Oh. And so that means could change a lot fast. And I should point out that um, there's about 12 or 13 other states that are following California's standards. So if they all go follow through, which is expected that they will, this is a lot of the Northeastern, Eastern states, Colorado, Oregon, um, that's about a third of the market. So this kind of tells you nationally what's likely to happen, a big chunk of the market. Now, what's the U.S. government going to do? Well, I was impressed. I'm impressed with all the things the president and the secretary say. But the reality is that there's probably not going to be anywhere near uh, the kind of policies at the federal level that we're seeing at California and these other states. So everything I said about California and the other states is going to probably be quite a bit slower in other parts of the country. Uh, even, you know, because they're going, you know, when we talk about penetration, uh, we're talking about three legs of a stool required to regulations, incentives, and infrastructure. And the feds are going to do a lot on infrastructure, maybe, um, but not that much on regulations, probably. Okay, so two other things I want to say. Um, I know I'm <laughs> just setting the stage here. So then there's trucks. That's just light duty vehicles. Then there's trucks. So California has the CARB. We passed a, adopted regulations last year um, requiring that starting in 20, uh, I wrote down the numbers here. You know, there's so many numbers, you know, it's all changing. So trucks, by the way, are about 20% of the total in terms of fuel consumption and emissions. And uh, what we're seeing is that those, the trucks, we have a requirement in place that the trucks will be, new sales will be about 9% in 2024, in three years, increasing to about 75% of sales being zero emission in 2035. And that's for most trucks. Long haul trucks, the number would be 40%. And many other states have adopted, uh, have signed an MOU saying they're going to follow California on that. Okay, so if we put all this together, um, I'm going to quote just a few numbers to, you know, get right to what you're asking. And that is, I was part of, we, I, part of leading an effort in California, the University of California. We did a major study on how to decarbonize transportation. And we did this for the legislature and executive agencies. So here's the numbers, you know, these are the, and this is for California. So right today, about 19 billion gallons of gasoline and diesel fuel are consumed, sold each year, are sold in California, 19 billion. And in a business as usual scenario, that would go down slowly because Vehicles are more efficient, some electric vehicles. But if we adopt these regulations and policies that I just described, um, what we call the low carbon scenario, that 19 billion in 2020 goes to 17 billion in 2025, 14 billion in 2030, 10 billion in 2035, and 3 billion in 2045. So let's say in 10 years, it'll be about 25% less. In 15 years, it would be 50% less. So I think that's really what we're looking at. Certainly in California and many other states, um, I'll be interested to hear what Carlo says about Utah, but you know, and, and that's not nationally, but that's for many of the states uh, in the country. 
So that's kind of sets the stage. I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it looks like, you know, there's an acceleration to, toward a tail from, you know, in the five year increments that you're doing it raises an interesting question. And, and actually, Carl, I'd like to ask this of you in terms of setting sort of this, this stage of the technological part of, of this challenge. In order for folks to have an affordable electric vehicle as part of their daily lives, they need a reliable and affordable source of electricity, you know, or if it was, you know, another fuel, that source as well. But on the electric front, you know, what does that look like exactly, that transition? And, you know, what is this, from your perspective, what is the state of the grid and is it ready for prime time in order to support an electric vehicle in every garage or an apartment parking space, local street, truck stop and bus yard? You know, what what is that path look like in terms of getting that infrastructure up and, and matched? Yes, uh, these are complex challenges and that requires a comprehensive Response. So bear with me for a moment as we look at the grid and utilities and how we make sure that we can accomplish these goals. So first, yes, uh, utilities can track the amount of electricity that is delivered uh, through a specific meter, but they can't normally track what that electricity is ultimately going to be used for. So electric utilities uh, are going to benefit from the adoption of EVs uh, simply because it's going to create a far larger opportunity to do what they do best, which is deliver electricity. Uh, So with the cooperation of utilities, there's likely technical solutions that will allow for the electrons that power EVs to be tracked and accounted for. Now, it's also important that a revenue collection mechanism not have the effect of limiting how EV chargers are going to be deployed. And we know just in California, we're going to need, Dan Sperling, you would know this better, 1.2 million to 1.6 million EV chargers to achieve the direction in which we are going. Now, in some situations, uh, we might want an EV charger on its own electric meter, But in other situations, uh, we might want the EV charger integrated with the meter for the building at which it's located. And there really needs to be a recognition that traditional transportation costs are not the only new costs involved that need to be funded. The cost to upgrade the the electric grid, Therese, that you mentioned, uh, and to allow it to carry the amount of electricity that's going to be required to essentially replace gasoline uh, will be astronomical and has not yet really been quantified that I've seen. Now, there are some significant public security risks that we're also going to need to take into account. We all know, and California is but one example, that sometimes our electric grid, your point, Therese, is not there for us. Maybe that's due. Maybe that's due to a wildfire or a storm or a public safety power shutoff or a rolling blackout. Uh, And what happens when our entire transportation system is placed on that same electric grid? And let's just use last summer and what we expect this summer as an example. Last summer, we in California saw 4.1 million acres destroyed through wildfires. That's the equivalent of the state of Delaware. This summer, we're told by the administration that it's going to be more than double that, roughly 8.8 million acres. That's Delaware and Massachusetts combined. At the same time of the third worst drought anticipated in our state's history. So as we shift to an ever increasing dependence on the electric grid, we have to take into account what we are risking if we don't strengthen that grid. Now it used to be when the power went out, we didn't have lights for a few hours. 
the average PSPS event last year was 36 hours. Current battery technology takes us about six hours to put that into context. So what happens when our entire transportation system, again, is placed on that grid? It, it, we're headed towards a world where when the power goes out, we not only lose our lights and our heat and our cooking, but increasingly that will mean losing our transportation and our mobility. And that's why it's really important that we're having this conversation and that it moved beyond just how do we play, replace the gas tax for electric vehicles to think about how widespread adoption of EVs is going to require investments far beyond what we are used to in terms of funding roads and bridges. And it's also going to create very serious new security considerations that we all know we need to address. So I'm in favor of a holistic approach that takes all of these different considerations into account and has a plan for each of them, especially ways to mitigate against the risk of electric grid outages, whether that is the eastern seaboard last July with Hurricane Isaias, the wildfires in California, the February freeze in Texas, these all impact our ability to move around or maybe even escape from a fire, a tornado, a hurricane, as we are more and more dependent on how we deliver, how we fuel our vehicles. Yes, those, those comments, Carl, I think are so important in terms of acknowledging the challenge of security around um, uh, whatever new platform, you know, we, we move to. And maybe that's something, Carlos, <laughs> that you can um, <clears throat> pick up maybe in, in your reflections on, on Utah's experience. But let me pivot to um, sort of the funding side of the equation that, that this, this session is talking about. Um, the state of Utah recently adopted a mileage fee for electric and hybrid vehicles. Um, so can you give us some background? How does this fee work? And what factors led Utah state legislators to instate the fee directly without first running a pilot, as many uh, states have been playing with on the margin? So really interesting. On, on that background. Yeah, good morning. Good morning, good afternoon. Uh, and thank you for the opportunity to participate here with, uh, with some friends uh, in this panel. Um, but it's important to always know the why. And for us, again, it's the driver behind that is air quality. We live in a basin here in Utah and uh, we are like the eighth most urbanized state in the country. We're a small state, but all our people live in this basin and air quality. We have real air quality problems when the winds don't blow. Uh, we're dealing with summer ozone problems right now and serious PM2 problems when the uh, high pressure sets up over Utah. So air quality continues to be one of the most important items for our citizens in the state of Utah. And our legislators and Governor Cox are committed that uh, moving as quickly as possible to um, low emission vehicles, electric vehicles, is going to be one of the most important things we can do because it makes up over 50 percent of our uh, particulate pollution is coming from our auto, our tailpipes right now. And it's really one of those targeted areas that we could really get to because dealing with the uh, pollution that are coming from our buildings is going to take a lot longer to, to work on. And, you know, so we're working on a strategic plan to actually install that infrastructure, electric charging infrastructure on a 50 mile spacing throughout the entire state transportation system. And we're going to be presenting that to the legislature here in the next couple of weeks on what that plan might be. Uh, but, you know, when you think about what this transition might be, and, and Dan had mentioned the pace of change, um, I think I think Dan's right on with his numbers, probably a little more aggressive than what we're going to see in the state of Utah. Um, but um, everyone gets really excited about this. And I think it's appropriate to be excited, but we start focusing on the amount of, you know, when an OEM starts talking about how many new percentage of their fleet that's going to be electric vehicles in the next couple of years, people don't fully comprehend the rollover of our fleet. You know, we have, you know, rollover, we have vehicles in the fleet that really don't leave that uh, use until after 22, 24 years. And, you know, it's our, 
usually are folks in the lower end of the economy that are um, that are left with those older vehicles, those more polluting vehicles. They're not the ones, you know, when we talk about incentives for electric vehicles, great idea, but those incentives are benefiting the higher, um, the folks higher up the economic ladder because uh, they're the ones actually buying new vehicles. And so that's going to be something we have to really focus on is how do we provide that more equitable distribution of the benefits of an electric vehicle. So I'm going to talk a little bit, just a little bit on the history because it's, it's amazing um, how things happen over time. So you have to flash back in Utah to actually 2003, 2004. We had just come off a fairly large highway building spree um, in anticipation of the 2002 Winter Olympics. So we, we, we started building new capacity, helping to facilitate the, uh, the, the games uh, that came off well. But then we were looking at, well, what's next? How are we going to fund that future expansion? And just as a point of, you know, of interest, Utah over the last 10 years was the fastest growing state in the country by population. We're expected to double our population in the next 35 to 40 years. And most of that population, 90% of it lives in an urbanized area in this, in this bowl that we have. And so in 2003, 2004, the legislature was looking at what do we do? And I'm just gonna read a quote that came out of their, their report that they um, then reported back to the full legislature. All citizens benefit from having a viable transportation system. And an over-reliance on a few traditional funding sources will not produce the revenue needed nor spread the tax burden fairly. The state must broaden the base for which ta transportation systems are funded. Reliance on a fuel tax alone will never be adequate for highway and transit needs. And so that was a statement back in 2004, and they listed as one of the tools that should be considered a road usage charge. And so it's been part of the legislative vernacular going back uh, that far. Um, and then if you fast forward in 2015, we were talking about looking for um, a few dollars to do a pilot. And Therese, this gets to your question, to start advancing some of those key questions. Because, you know, the more you know about something, the more questions come up. And we've been working with Ruck West, 14 states um, of the 18 Western states. We've been working with them for years as a member, uh, California being a participant as well, um, and trying to answer, strategically answer those key questions. And so we were talking to the legislature about allowing us to do a pilot to start working on those. And they jumped right away into this idea that um, we want to move ahead faster and be a little more aggressive. And I, I would have to say that it, it my over 35 years here at the Utah Department of Transportation has led me to understand that uh, as a conservative state, we're also a state that's willing to take chances. And we're willing, obviously, if you take chances, you have to be willing to make mistakes. We've made plenty of mistakes, but uh, we're, we, did, we get anxious about not moving ahead. And so 2015, they started saying, we want to move ahead faster. 2017, they put together another task force. That's usually the way legislators work, right? If they can't get to a bold decision. Uh, let's put together a task force and it's kind of a way to defer things, but it really does help coalesce the conversation and it brings broader conver um, voices to the conversation is what it, I think the benefit of it is. And what came then from there is in 2018, they passed a Senate Bill 136, uh, which said, we wanna create an operational program. We want it to be voluntary and you dot figure out how to do it. And you have the authority to figure out how much to charge for that. So um, we were told by January 1 of 2020, this had to be up and running. And uh, just, to, you know, obviously, you know, we were just entering a very interesting time in our in our in the world, in our country. And so what they did is they provided a um, they wanted, you know, fairness is one of the principles here. They wanted the folks that use the system to pay the appropriate amount. And so what they were seeing is those that had more, the, the richer people that were able to buy electric vehicles were actually paying less for their use of the system. They recognize this is not something that's a problem today, but they see this as a problem ha manifesting itself over the next 10, 15, 20 years. And because I, I always counsel people, do not think that this is something we need to solve today. Road usage charge program is not going to bring in more revenue. Don't think of it that way. I try to say that this is really, think about it as a transition. As the effectiveness of the road use of the, of the fuel tax starts to decrease, think about how you can then start to merge in the, um, 
the reduce its charge to complement that in a transitionary period over 10, 15, 20 years, whatever it might be. Um, because I think that's the way we have to think of it. So the legislature passed this fee schedule where uh, on a yearly basis, electric vehicles, for instance, would pay $120. It's still half of what a comparable uh, average uh, 20 mile per hour vehicle would pay in fuel taxes. It's still well about half of what they would pay in fuel taxes a year. Um, we then went put together a, uh, a program. Uh, we determined that 1.5 cents, the way we wanted to do this is, is we didn't want people to pay more if they chose to enroll in the road usage charge program. And so we, we, we did the math and we said, we're gonna cap it at whatever that fee amount would be. Um, but if you enter the road usage charge program, if you drive less, you pay less. That was our, our catch phrase on that. And so, uh, at, you know, uh, one and a half cents per mile. Um, we're, we're, we have almost over 3,800 people that have chosen to participate in the voluntary program so far, um, which is, you know, we, we have, uh, and part of those are plug-in hybrids as well, as well as gas hybrids. And I was really surprised to see the gas hybrids uh, participate in it because their incentive wasn't as much. But there's a lot of people that really like technology and love the extra information that they receive uh, as part of the program. It's completely voluntary. It is, um, uh, we have a third party hired um, that interfaces with the customer that collects that information. We just get uh, monthly reports on how much customer A drove per month. We do not know where that customer drove. That firewall is imp really important because the idea of privacy uh, for the public, I think is critical. Before you move forward, you need to artic articulate how important that is. And so we, we have this program, people keep enrolling. It's, it's more of a trickle now, but we've worked with the DMV and all the new car um, sales, points of sale. And uh, so they make that option available to folks and they, they can choose to sign up. And so it's not quote, making money. Uh, I think it's important. The cost to administer a program like this is more than collecting the excise tax, which is a very efficient way, um, but is a, it's, been a great learning experience, and I believe it's going to be something that over time will allow more policy levers. And that, to me, is, I think, going to be one of the real benefits on this. Because if you think in the future, if we're growing and doubling our population, we don't have room to double the highway miles. We have to do a better job of operating the highway system and using policy levers of being able to provide different rates for travel at different points of time on different facilities um, will, I believe, better optimize the investments made today and maybe help to incentivize people's travel choices as well. So Teresa, I'm sorry if I babbled on. I, uh, I don't write down what I'm gonna say. And so I just kind of go off, so. Thank well, you. It, you know, it's what's clear is that you're really passionate about what you've done to date. And I think importantly, sending the message that the, you have a lot of lessons learned that for the rest of us, we need to take heed on that and be able to incorporate them. So I wanna, Pick up a bit, um, Asha. You know, on on the the financing issue again. You know, we heard specifically a lot of the thought and debate happening at the state level in Utah. But what does the research tell us about how the American public views the concept of mileage fees as a possible replacement for fuel excise taxes? Well, that is a question near and dear to my heart. Um, since 2010, the Mineta Institute, Transportation Institute has graciously funded research that I've done in collaboration with Dr. Hillary Nixon, where we're doing an annual poll asking the American adults what they think of both raising the federal gas tax and then the idea of a new mileage fee. Um, we actually are going to be releasing the detailed findings next week of this recent spring survey for anyone who wants to know more. But let me just share a few of the results um, specifically about whether people support the concept of raising, of, of creating a mileage. So to put the results I'm about to share from this year into context, I should explain that when we started our survey in 2010, we asked people, would you support the idea of a federal mileage fee where everybody pays a penny per mile? And not real popular, as you might imagine. We had 33% of people at that time saying, 
this is something I support. John, you know, to today, our 12th survey in the um, series, and we find that roughly half of Americans say they would support different versions of a mileage fee. And let me offer just a few more details there. So we are actually, we, we raised our rate in the survey. So we now ask people if they would support a three cent per mile um, fee for all vehicles on every mile driven as a replacement for the gas tax. And we had 47% of people saying that they would support this concept. Now, interestingly, and this is a trend that we have seen throughout the survey series, when we ask people about a variation on that idea that we call a green mileage fee, where the average rate would be three pennies a mile, but less polluting vehicles pay less and more polluting vehicles pay more, we find higher support. So in this case, we had this year 53% of people. So now clearly roughly half, but over that majority threshold said that they would support this idea of what we call the green mileage. Now, another thing we did, because really for this survey, we were just trying to explore a variety of, of ideas and concepts related to mileage fees. We asked people about a hypothetical, what we called a business road use fee. And this would be um, assessed on the miles that commercial vehicles are driving on the job. And we asked a few different variations. And one of them is we said, well, what about this idea of a business road use fee on ride hailing vehicles for the miles driven on the job? And 52% supported that idea. And when we asked about the same concept, but this time a fee for freight and delivery vehicles, um, we had 52% supporting this idea. So again, roughly half of Americans seem to be supporting the concept of a mileage fee, you know, in a variety of different flavors. The last thing I'll just wrap up with here is to mention that in our survey, we ask people all kinds of other questions, um, their opinions on transportation related topics, some simple travel behavior questions on um, their kind of personal sociodemographics and opinions. And so that we can look to see are there sift specific subgroups in the population that are maybe more comfortable and, and supportive of this mileage fee opposite um, concept or the flip, of course, who oppose it more. And interestingly, when we look at who supports the mileage fee, kind of across the five different options we asked people about, there were four um, personal characteristics that showed up again and again as these are the people who are more supportive of this concept. Um, and the first th three of them, I think, are probably not going to be enormously surprising to anybody. Um, they were being younger than 55 as compared to people who are over 55. These are the people who are like, noticeably more supportive, not just a few percentage points more supportive. Also, people who live in an urban area were more supportive. People who either said they were a registered Democrat or at least affiliate, you know, kind of leaned towards the Democratic Party were more supportive. Now, the last one, um, I think people probably won't um, find quite as intuitive. We asked people how recently they thought the federal gas tax rate had been raised. Um, and we gave people some ranges, you know, last three years, four to 10, et cetera. Um, and we found that people who incorrectly, by the way, think that the federal government has raised the gas tax rate within the last 10 years were much more supportive of a mileage fee than people who thought either didn't know or thought that it had been raised longer ago. And as a side note, I will say that it's not surprising, but as someone in the business, it makes me a little sad. Only 2% of Americans correctly answered our survey saying that the federal gas tax rate has not been raised in more than 20 years. Um, and we all know in the business it's low, but when you see that 2%, it's, it's a striking number. Wow. Yeah, it, it, it is striking. And then, Dan, maybe we can kind of weave this into the next uh, um, question for you. I mean, one of the interesting things that you know we've picked up, Asha, from, from your research is it's interesting to see the distinction. So when people start connecting the dots between impact and, um, and, a, and a particular mechanism, 
So, Dan, as we you know think about alternatives to an excise tax on gasoline and diesel, um, you know, what are some of the, th- the, the best ways of design, designing a user charge system, um, taking into consideration, again, connecting the dots to larger transportation related goals for con- even if it's congestion pricing or pollution, equity, you know, disadvantaged communities? Is there a way? I think there's two parts to this. First of all, is there a way to do that coherently? (laughs) But then secondly, to communicate that in a way that the public understands and appreciates it in terms of motivating a change. Well, you know, you're getting right at the base of the fundamentals here. What's going to happen? So, I mean, it's like you say, either we have a fuel tax or we have an energy related tax, such as Carl was talking about, or general revenue. And, you know, federal level, we've gone, been going a little bit more towards general revenue, but I don't think that's um, politically tenable or desirable. So, okay, so let's focus on this road user charge. So the energy, you know, taxing it at the utility has all kinds of other problems as well. Um, so let's focus on this road user charge, because I think what Utah is doing and Oregon is doing is tremendously innovative. And California has been uh, doing to some extent, too. Um, so the question is, how do we do that? And so I'm kind of going to be toss out what I think we should be doing. And that is that, you know, I think so far, Oregon and as what I understand in Oregon and Utah is they're using it um, they're, they're not basing it on a, 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 a telematics device in the vehicle. And I think that really has to be the future where it's built into the car by the car companies. And, and, and that's how we do the charging. And, you know, we can protect for privacy and there's ways of doing that. You know, right now, cars collect lots and lots of data. There's a little what we call onboard diagnostic device that in some insurance companies use, and they download information to use for insurance rates. So this is already happening, and there's lots of ways of protecting it, that data. Carlos was starting to talk about that a little bit. But that's what we need is that device in the vehicle that records how much the car is driven. And the reason why that's so important is that's a hardware. And once we have the hardware in there, then we can do these other you know, pursue other goals. The other important goals would be mostly congestion and pollution slash uh, climate. And, you know, we've come, you know, transportation used to be treated as this kind of autonomous thing, unrelated to society. You know, we just had engineers building roads, but we've all come to appreciate transportation is intricately embedded connected, linked with, you know, everything else. You know, we're talking about environmental justice. We're talking about a lot of things here, pollution, health. So once we get that de- technology in the car, um, we, we have the mechanism for raising funding, but then we can adjust it with software to account for congestion, i.e. congestion pricing. We can use it for pollution and greenhouse gases. Because, you know, if you have a flat mileage fee, that actually um, discourages efficient energy efficiency. You know, the, the, a gas tax actually encourages efficiency because you pay by the gallon. So you have an incentive to use fewer gallons, but a road user charge doesn't do that. And so it actually encourages, in a sense, gasoline consumption. So we need to build into this um, these other goals. And if you have the device in there, we can do it. Now, I know, you know, there's people that don't like, you know, that want small government. And they say, if you do a road user charge, it's just a foot in the door. So you do these other things and they're exactly right. But that's exactly what we should be doing. <laughs> um, we've got to bring some rationality to the transportation system uh, as we go forward. And, and I really think that's exactly the way to do it. Oh, that that's so interesting. Um, can I, can you I want play to on that for a second? Go ahead, Carlos. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I agree 100 percent with Dan on this one. And that's it. We are only collecting it either through the OBT2 port 
or through telematics. There's actually vehicles right now that are on the road that do not have that diagnostic port in them. And so what it forces you to do, it forces you to um, enter into agreements with each one of the OEMs to have them provide just the finite amount of data that you need to administer the program. And they, the OEMs are very protective about this data because it represents, um, you know, there's revenue that they're going to generate from this data and they, they worry about their relationship with their customer. And so we've been successful because I believe getting away from using those plugins into the diagnostic port is going to be key because those are expensive. They cost, we have to use cell technology to transmit that mileage data. And so hundred percent with Dan. And I think when, once you have gotten to that point, you're going to be able to now broaden the world because, you know, we always talk about user pay concept and the user pay concept is broader than just a car on a road. It's what that car is doing to the environment as well. And we will then have the ability to be able to, I think, appropriately charge for the impacts created by choices made on type of vehicle, time of day, those types of things. So, yeah, no, that, that I, I'm really glad that you that you <clears throat> added that additional observation because it I, I want to take that and and toss this back to Carl because one of the things I'm picking up here is in this space of moving to a different energy driven platform for transportation, irrespective of the benefits and regions and impacts why, there is going to have to be, let's like call, call this a, a recalibrated public-private partnership to really make all of this happen. And Carl, you've been one of the best crosswalkers between private sector and public sector, trying to get toward a common, you know, policy objective to the public interest. You know, I, I like your thoughts about how you see that working in this particular uh, transportation energy shift. Thanks, Therese, because this is going to be an incredible balancing act. And it reminds me for us movie buffs of that opening scene in Raiders of, uh, of the Lost Ark, where, uh, where uh, Harrison Ford is in Central America and he's in that cave and he is trying to switch the gold idol in one hand with the bag of sand in the other and getting that transition just right, or he's going to have poisonous darts shooting at him and a rolling boulder heading towards him if he gets it wrong. And we all saw what happened. He didn't get it right and barely escaped. And that is a lot of the balancing act that we as transportation professionals and our uh, citizen and resident colleagues and the general public have to consider as we make these transitions. And whether that's our work at the California Transportation Commission on the road user charge and the thousands of folks, including myself, who went through that pilot, as with Carlos doing similar in Utah, uh, we have to make sure we get this right. Now, Senate Bill 1 from 2017 tried to make at least some account of that transition in that one of the funding sources, in addition to the increase in the gas tax and other increases was also an, um, a fee on electric vehicles. Now, whether it was enough, at least we're starting to head in that direction. But I'm gonna hearken back to comments made earlier by other leaders that we heard from in our dialogue today, that as we do this, we have to build equity into the model. We here in the nine county Bay Area, Therese, that you through the Metropolitan Transportation Commission uh, represent so well. And as we consider revenue sources like vehicle miles traveled, we have to be very careful from an equity perspective that we're not burdening a lot of poor folks who are making those longer and longer distance commutes with often very few options other than an automobile. 
And often automobiles that are older, less fuel efficient, dirtier, and in worse shape. So this is an incredible balancing act, Therese, going back to what you said of why public and private sector, we need to work really carefully together as we change that gold idol with that bag of sand. So, so let me, Therese, let me just uh, amend what I said earlier, just quickly. So the other goals are, um, besides raising revenue, are congestion, pollution, and equity. And I would agree with Carl, but you know, that can be built into it. And I know Asha knows a lot about this too. She probably has lots of good answers how to do that. You're on Reese, mute. you're on mute and we'd yeah. love to hear what you said. <laughs> yeah. So, so Asha, maybe we can pick up on that in terms of, you know, from your perspective and the research you've done, what are the factors needed to that need to be balanced in this shift, or again, the, the proposed shift from a fuel tax-based revenue source to one not based on that. Um, is, is, there, is there a sort of magic set of must-haves in order for it to be deemed successful? Well, again, what, are, what, are the, what would be the metrics of success? In, in so, if I had the answer, of course, I would be a wildly popular woman in our uh, professional community. So sadly, I can't give a precise answer. But I think that let me talk about some of the sort of some of the issues I think we need to address and focus on and find solutions to. Um, and I'm going to talk in particular about two that have already been raised, equity and climate. So from a climate perspective, which actually overlaps with equity, right now the gas tax, as, as Dan mentioned, you, you pay a bit more if you have a gas guzzler and presumably environmentally less friendly vehicle than you do if you have something cleaner, which, by the way, doesn't have to be a fancy electric car. It could just be a very high mileage Toyota Corolla that's in good, you know, working, running order. And so... If we switch to a mileage fee, and in most states, the idea so far that's been discussed is a flat rate, you're basically transferring the tax burden from the polluting vehicles to the clean vehicles. And this polling I've done over the years shows people don't think that's fair. A pretty large you know, proportion of people actually think that's unfair at the same time that they also don't for the most part, think it's fair that an electric vehicle pay nothing. So in our more recent survey, we asked people, um, do you think that electric, if, if there were a mileage fee, should electric vehicles pay the same rate as everybody else, half the rate or nothing? And we had um, well over half saying that they thought that the electric vehicles should pay less. Um, so there's, there's that. And another thing, though, is shifting now to um, other equity considerations, which get to sort of the administration of a program and how we set it up so that it's administered in a way that's not overly burdensome on low-income families. So there's certainly the rate. Um, you know, what are these low-income families um, paying um, and actually, our survey this year, we added a new question where we asked if the federal government were to introduce a mileage fee, do you think that low income families or drivers should pay a lower rate per mile? And we had um, a, a good majority of people saying, yes, they do. Now, of course, there are also administrative issues that come up, you know, if I'm low income, will I lend my car out to somebody who's higher income and they may, you know, maybe share the, the cost savings at any rate. But that concept definitely resonated with people. However, the last thing I want to say on this topic, which I think is not getting nearly as much attention as it should and is solvable, but needs to be squarely faced, is how you pay not the amount you're paying in this case, but how you pay. So for example, a lot of um, some of the programs envision an annual payment. You know, you accrue your mileage over the year and then you make an annual payment. Well, um, for low-income families, that is a problem 
And I like to say that right now, nobody budgets to pay the gas tax. We don't save money to pay the gas tax. It's just we pay a few dollars here and there as part of you know, purchasing fuel. But if you get stuck at the end of the year with a bill for one or two or three or five hundred dollars for very low income families, that's difficult. So somehow figuring out a way to administer the program that people pay in small increments or at least have the option to do that and don't pay a financial penalty for taking advantage of that. And then the related thing is to think about um, people who are unbanked. You know, there's quite a large percentage of the U.S. population, I've seen 15, 20 percent, who don't have a credit card and don't have a bank account that they could set up for automatic payments. Um, and so some of the systems, and by the way, I think Utah is doing an amazing job and that we're going to learn a lot from it. But, you know, over time, one of the things I would hope Utah would figure out is how can people participate in the program if they don't have a credit card? Because right now you do have to do that to participate. So again, this equity, of course, there's how much people pay, but there's also how often they pay and making payment convenient, even for people who don't have a lot of financial tools at their disposal. Well, folks, we have about five minutes left. So I have one question and you'll each get a minute. And it's this. And it's a it's an easy one, except, you know, you'll need your crystal ball in front of you. The year is 2050, middle of the millennium. Where are we in terms of transportation, our community, and our planet. I will start with Carlos. <laughs> wow, you should have started one, one of our professors. Um, <laughs> uh, I, a lot of this is, uh, I, well, we're gonna have, I believe we're gonna probably be um, 30 to 60% of the fleet's gonna be electrified of the light duty fleet. I think we're going to have a I'm hoping we have a more fairer system in terms of how people are um, paying for access to transportation. And I, that's, where I, that's what I think we can do with a road usage program, more so than we can do with just the uh, fuel tax program. I think it provides those policy levers that will allow our policymakers to make those difficult decisions to incentivize the right things and to charge for those behaviors that are not as contributing towards the public good as they need to. There needs to be, there will, there will be, I think, a greater recognition that the public good is impo something important to prioritize and that as individuals, this idea of individual freedom, um, there's a balance between those two. And I think we're gonna get there. There's a great conversation going on for that right now. That's terrific. Dan, a minute. One minute. Okay. 2050, almost all cars and trucks will be, will be electric or hydrogen by 2050 in the United, definitely in California. And I think most of the United States, I think that there will be many more transportation choices. Um, everything from active, you know, bikes and scooters to ride hailing, and we're going to see a lot of automated vehicles by then. And, and that's going to provide a lot of choice because just think of, you know, Uber pool on steroids. This will be less expensive transportation. It will be very responsive to equity concerns, low income and, and physically disabled people will be able to get low, low cost transportation and then they'll be electric. And so we're going to have a beautiful, um, sustainable, transportation system. Finally. Finally. Asha, <laughs> what's your perspective? Well, by 2050, I agree with the others that I think our fleet will be largely not running on gas and diesel. Um, I, I hope and I think looking at the experience of other countries like the Netherlands, which quite quickly went from U.S. style auto dependence to being this bike capital of the world. I think that in our major urban areas, we, fingers crossed, some wood to knock on nearby, we'll see a lot less people, a lot fewer people driving in a large vehicle themselves to travel one, two, three miles. And I think there will probably be a wide diversity of public transit and bike and 
Um, micro mobility. The last thing I would say um, is I hope we'll have a lot more vehicle sharing, that there will be more of um, the idea that you, you get the right vehicle for that specific trip you want to make, um, whether that's a cargo bike or a one person little electric pod that you can carry groceries in. So, and I think that that can also really help to make transportation more affordable if you don't have to own the vehicles, if you can essentially be renting. There you go. And Carl, bring us home. Therese, I will. First, the optimist in me says that we will all be gathered in 2050 to celebrate my 89th birthday. And as we do that, we will be amazed at the technological change that can and will happen over those 29 years. And to put that in perspective, think of what we had technologically 29 years ago in 1992, where almost none of the advances that we see today were created or even thought of outside of a great science fiction novel. So let's hope from an optimistic perspective that we will have gotten our act together, not just as states and a country, but as a planet to ensure that we have clean, renewable, resilient energy for every person and community on the planet that is affordable whether it's for their mobility choices or their stationary needs. I thank you to all of you panelists. Um, you. Asha Weinstein Agrawal, Director of the, of the MTI National Transportation Finance Center. Carlos Bracetas, Executive Director, Utah Department of Transportation. Carl Gardino, Executive Vice President, Government Affairs for Policy Bloom Energy. And Dan Sperling, PhD Professor of Civil and Environmental Engineering, UC Davis. Thank you all so much. Thanks also to today's keynote speaker, Tos, Toks Omishakin, Director of the California Department of Transportation. And of course, our gratitude to the Honorable Pete Buttigieg, U.S. Secretary of Transportation. Many thanks to Dr. Karen Philbrick, Executive Director of the Mineta Transportation Institute at San Jose State University for her earlier participation. And we also thank all of you and remind you to visit the Commonwealth Club's website to learn more about upcoming events. Today's program has been sponsored by the Veneta Transportation Institute at San Jose State University. I'm Therese McMillan, Executive Director of the Metropolitan Transportation Commission. And now this meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California is adjourned. Thank you all. Thank you.